Today's Holy Gospel comes to us from John 2. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, The temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This is an incredible section of scripture, full of deep theological ideas. But to understand it, we have to get a fuller understanding of first century culture. One of my favorite ways of exploring these theological ideas is by rooting the theology in the stories. You cannot understand the main characters and ideas of a book without rooting it into the stories that they live in. What we know about God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit comes from these epic narratives that we follow each year. However, it can be hard to engage in the narrative if you don't know where you are in the story. It's like, it's like walking into the middle of a movie. So this morning, we're going to immerse ourselves in uh, culture, in the culture that the Bible was written in. In the first century, people lived in an honor and shame based culture. What I, what I mean is, is that honor was, was like the, the social currency that made the ancient world go around. Honor would determine what types of jobs you got, uh, where you would sit at a table, or, or even who you could speak to. Uh, the way that we feel today about money, the, the security it brings, or the worry when it might not be there, that's how people felt, how ancient people felt about honor. If you got married in the first century, the promises were made under the fear of honoring or dishonoring the entire family. How you acted reflected not only on you, but your family, your, your town, your, your entire ethnic group. Entire wars were fought just to protect or establish the honor of kings. Saul hunted David down mostly because he was uh, one-upped by David in battle, and his honor was shamed. And the only way for Saul to recover his honor was to kill David. This culture is still prevalent in Eastern society today. On a, on a larger scale, the rise of ISIS is in part a reaction to international shame. And it's their attempt to restore Islam's honor through violence. In an ISIS worldview, uh, blood will erase their shame. So I want you to keep this idea of a culture founded upon honor as we walk and get closer to the Easter story. Because much of what happens during Holy Week is an interplay of shame and honor. And my hope this morning is that through this new cultural window, we get a better sense of Jesus heart, his servant heart. So in less than a month, we will celebrate Palm Sunday. 
Palm Sunday is the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Let's read from John 12. The, the next day, a great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. This laying of palm branches is nothing new in first century culture. There are historical records of cities doing this exact thing uh, before Alexander the Great. The laying of palm branches is this giving of honor before a powerful king. It's a recognition of the king's greatness. That, that even the king's feet, the feet being the, the most shameful part of a person, that even the king's feet held honor so much that they shouldn't touch the ground. It would be like rolling out the red carpet, but even more. If a, a giant army was outside the gates of your city and you knew there is just no way that you could hold them off, you had the choice uh, to either get pummeled in battle or, or fling open the city gates and put palm branches down and hand over the keys to your city in the chance you might be spared. And when the king and his followers would enter your city, you might wave palm branches in greeting or, or bow to give honor to the incoming king. You would lower your status or honor and give tribute. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, his reputation had preceded him. No one before him had ever shown the, the divinity, uh, the miraculous, the, and the power that Jesus commanded. His honor status was at an all-time high in people's eyes. So, either people were excited to see this agent of the divine, or they might have well been scared they had seen armies before, but they had never seen someone command seas, uh, cast out demons, heal with words, or, or resurrect the dead. If this was the conquering king the Jews had been praying for, then it was a wise move to fling open the city gates, lay down palms before this, this God-man. Who knows? Who knows what he might do? I love, I love how aware Jesus is of this honor-shame dynamic. Because before entering the city, he goes and he finds a donkey to ride into town on. Because you see, a warring general who, whose aim was to take the city would come in on a war horse. Uh, that would be festooned with armor and displaying implements of war. He would want people to be afraid. Jesus, aware of this dynamic, picks a humble animal, uh, a donkey. To say from the get-go, his mission was of a different kind. He lowers his status as he comes into the city. Matthew 21 as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was said through the prophet Say to your daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. 
A very large crowd had spread their cloaks on the ground while others cut branches from the trees and spread them right on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted. For those who knew Jesus, who had been following him, this was nothing new. Jesus was constantly surrendering his status, lowering his honor to show love to those bound by shame. Prostitutes, tax collectors, adulterers, the mentally ill, the poor, the sick. He sought out those that society had discarded. Society's lost coins, lost sheep. That is why Jesus' next move in the city became such a huge deal. After this entrance into Jerusalem, he goes to the temple to worship his father, to give honor to the God of Abraham. When he gets there, he sees that the people have desecrated the temple by turning it into, into a business. They have shamed Yahweh. They've made it harder for the poor to connect to God by tripling the cost of their offerings, uh, introducing a currency that, that only worked in the temple, or forcing them to exchange the animals they brought for approved temple animals. Jesus, outraged at the desecration and dishonoring of his father's temple, he flips out literally flips out and overturns the money-changing stations. He, he braids a cord and chases out the money-changers. He, he shames them. He exposed their deceitfulness in front of everyone. This would have been headline news. It would have been all anybody could have talked about. The Pharisees, having been shamed, having their honor in Jerusalem lowered to rock bottom, they're now waiting for the opportunity to restore their place in society. When you've been shamed this hard, there's only one way to cure it. Death. Blood. Death of the one who dishonored you. The disciples must have been on an all-time high. Remember, Jesus' honor reflects on his group, right? Well, they walked into the city at the side of the guy who got all the palm branches. They were eating dinner. They were eating Passover with the most important, visible man in Jerusalem. But Jesus already smells the, the whiff of death. In the telling of the Passover dinner, the writer makes it clear that Judas had already sided with the Pharisees who had been dishonored. He'd already, he'd already switched teams, took the money, and Jesus was being set up for the fall. The culture of honor balancing is in motion and won't rest until death restores the Pharisees' honor. And now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The, the devil who had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all the things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that had been tied around him. Jesus, being aware of all the complexity surrounding himself, does something fascinating. He serves his followers wine and bread, like a servant, and then goes one step further and washes their feet. This act was usually reserved for the least honorable in the house, the, the lowest slave. 
to touch another's feet was about the, the worst job in the household. Peter, Peter can't believe what he is seeing. It's too mind-bending for him. It would have been like the, the president of your company washing your dog or like a neurosurgeon helping you blow your nose. Uh, it just feels wrong, uncomfortable. And at first, Peter refuses to let Jesus dishonor himself by washing his feet. Jesus rebukes him and says, if Peter doesn't let him wash his feet, then he can't be a part of the kind of kingdom Jesus has in mind. John 13, 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am, a place of honor. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. The kingdom Jesus wanted to establish, set up, was a break in cultural norms. You see, kings, kings didn't serve. They were served. But this kingdom was to be different. It turned more than temple tables over. It changed the way the world functioned. Instead of looking for power and honor, Jesus' new kingdom makers were to intentionally lower their status and serve. But it also did something more. Foot washing is a way of welcoming home those into the house of God. The foot washing reveals the promise of a full relationship with God. And Jesus offered to those whom Jesus loves. By washing his disciples' feet, Jesus enters into an intimate relationship with the disciples that mirrors the intimacy of his relationship with God. This, this is the message of Christianity. This is the sales pitch of the gospel. To give, to give up what you hold as important for a life of serving others. If this was an infomercial, uh, you might change the channel. But this is what God calls us to do. If you want to follow Jesus, Jesus asks you to put down your stuff, your life, what you think is important, and pick up his cross and follow him. By serving others, we are mirroring the love of God to the world. When we serve others, we welcome them into God's kingdom. Matthew 16, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? In the first century, there's no greater place of dishonor than the cross. The cross is where, where the town would display their criminals. The cross is as low as a person could get, naked, whipped, punished for their crime, on, on display to be mocked. Jesus willingly walks to the cross, the most shameful place a human has ever been, out of love, as a servant, his final act, a gift of his life for you and me. 
Jesus asks us to give up what we hold on to so tight for our meaning, for purpose, to serve. Why? This is because this is where he is. Jesus is a status-lowering, honor-giving servant. And if you dive into the Gospels, this is where Jesus has been from the very beginning. I've been uh, in ministry for many years, and I have students come up to me all the time and ask me, what is God's plan for their lives? They're stressing out, trying to figure out their life's purpose, their, their major, their college, their vocation, trying to understand what God has called them to do with their life. And I tell them, I know exactly what God has called them to do. Jesus has called them to wash feet, to serve, to pick up the cross and follow him. This is what he had, has called us all to do. God's purpose for our lives isn't mysterious. It's right in front of our faces. Perhaps, perhaps sometimes we just don't want to see it. So this morning, is there a place where you feel almost a magnetic pull to serve, but haven't yet? Maybe you don't have uh, enough information or, or don't know how to start. Maybe you just can't get over the mental block and see yourself really doing whatever God is calling you to do. And maybe you're just not sure how, would it, how it would affect you or your family or schedule. Now, did you notice when Jesus to, goes to wash the feet of his followers, he has to set aside his outer clothes. He can't serve dressed as he is. He has to, he has to shed something. So what is in the way this morning? What do you need to shed for you to follow that little idea that the Holy Spirit keeps poking at you with? What would you need to set aside? Is it your status? Is it the success of your career in order to, to be closer with your family? Is it all the energy you give to maintaining the image you portray to the world? Is it your bank account? Uh, the address of your house, your job title, the vicarious success of your kids or the self-worth you have given yourself through an overly busy schedule. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what place or piece of your honor Jesus is calling you to lay at the cross this morning, but I'm going to guess that the Holy Spirit is working in every person listening to put down what they've been holding so tightly. For some of you, what you need most is to allow yourself to be served. Maybe you're Peter in the story. And the idea of letting someone, let alone God, take care of you is terrifying. Why are we like this? Why, why am I like this? I would 100 times rather serve someone than let someone see that I might need to be served. But Jesus says we can't join his movement, this movement. We can't be a part of it until we let him wash our feet. We can't always take the high ground. Sometimes we have to set our honor aside, but to be served. Jesus' action is a welcoming action. Is it a, it's a hospitable action. Jesus wants us to come home to be served by him, to be accepted, warts and bunions and all. He doesn't want clean feet or a perfect heart. He wants you and to do the work with you. Whether it is serving or being served, Jesus accepts us and challenges us while we still have dirty feet. Amen.